welcome to the uh, Oral History Project. So this is uh, being recorded at the 2014 annual meetings of the American Society of Criminology. So I'm pleased to introduce Professor Nikki Rafter, Nicole Rafter, can I call you Nikki? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> from Northeastern University. Uh, she's also an affiliated faculty member with the uh, Law, Policy, or Law Policy and Society program at uh, Northeastern. And rather than, than list her uh, educational uh, credentials and, and background, I'll turn that over to Nikki in just a moment. But it's important to highlight that uh, she won the uh, 2009 uh, Sutherland Award from the American Society of Criminology. And, uh, really proud moment uh, for uh, those of us at uh, Northeastern University and was also then uh, followed that up with a Fulbright experience in Austria the, the spring summer right after having won the award. Uh, it was quite a year for you. Um, so um, to get us started why don't you give us some uh, uh, talk about your educational background where you came from uh, how why you decided to go to Swarthmore Oh, I decided to go to Swarthmore because I couldn't <coughs> stand Oberlin, um, which is where I was originally. And Robert and I practically got ourselves kicked out of school under circumstances I won't go into. But <laughs> um, I uh, then took a semester off and decided to go. I had been accepted at Swarthmore and Oberlin and decided I really wished I'd been at Swarthmore all along. So. Um, Robert and I got married after I was at Swarthmore for a term, and I finished at Swarthmore. Uh, he, he was sure he wanted to go into education, and at that point I was just following him. So we went to Harvard and got a degree which is no longer um, offered, called an MAT degree. It was really a good degree, called Masters of Arts in Teaching. So you took substance, substantive courses, at that time, my field was English, uh, and you also took courses at the Ed School. And we had practice teaching. I taught at Concord High School. And um, it was a good experience, because you learned something about thinking about students, um, as well as about how awfully hard it was to stand up there in front of them. Um, and then we went to Greece and um, had children and came back. Um, and following Robert, uh, we, we were living in the Berkshires. He was teaching uh, and I at full time, and I was teaching part time English courses. And I found myself teaching more and more courses called things like crime, sin, and punishment, and. Um, using the old chestnuts that had to do with those topics, um, but probably would have stayed on teaching English courses, except that the dean, the bad guy uh, there, um, said, well, enrollments are down and I'm going to let go all the part-timers because those, they're women, these are part-time women, and they don't need the income. And I, I was so annoyed. Um, I didn't even have the language to know why I was annoyed. This was um, early 1970s. But um, so I said, I'll leave and I'll take Robert with me. I didn't know what that meant. I mean, it was just <laughs> low hard stuff. But I said, so I looked around into criminal justice programs. I didn't know anything at all about them. Uh, I got some catalogs somewhere. I found one for uh, University of Connecticut. I found the name of um, delinquent boys, Albert, Albert Cohen. And so I sat down, never heard of him, and said, Dear Albert Cohen, <laughs> um, I'm thinking of going to graduate school. Uh, would you please tell me what would be, would, would SUNY Albany, which was the school closest to me, be a good choice? And I didn't hear from him for a long, long time. It turned out later he'd been in Israel, and he hadn't gotten my letter. 
but when he got back to Yukon, he wrote, I wish I'd kept this letter. He wrote me a very long, thoughtful letter that said essentially, you'll be fine if you go to SUNY Albany. So I did. Yeah. And then um, who, who did you work with while you were at uh, um, SUNY? So uh, the chair of my dissertation committee um, was uh, Don Newman, who had done a lot of work on plea bargaining. He was sort of Mr. Plea Bargaining. Um, and Graham Newman, who was enormously helpful to me because he tended to teach from humanities literature and that gave me a way to bridge my two lives. Uh, and then Fred Cohen, who was a lawyer. And so they were my committee. And um, so how did you find your experience at, at Albany? Well, I think it was sort of a mixed bag for me. There was only one woman teacher, uh, Marguerite Warren, and she was very friendly to me, but she was very marginalized by the faculty. I mean, they openly laughed at her. Um, and, I mean, there are other women there besides me, um, but we were definitely second, third rate citizens, class citizens. Um, I, I, so it was complicated. It was complicated. I think Don Newman, I, I grew to be very fond of him. He was a, did you do know him at all? No. He was real gruff, heavy drinker. And I'd come in and I'd try to talk to him about something. He, he'd bellow and he'd say, how the hell should I know? <laughs> and it would terrify me. <laughs> so I'd scuttle out. <laughs> so, so at what point did you um, start thinking of yourself as a criminologist? Or have you ever thought of yourself as a criminologist? I think probably when I got my degree and I had to explain myself to people, people would say, oh, criminology, how wonderful, my dear. You're going to help juvenile delinquents. And I'd say, with a snarl, <laughs> no, I'm going to work in the men's maximum security prison or research them, which is what I ended up doing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the um, other influences in uh, your life, career, either at the personal level, professional level, mentors, um, people who, who gave you that early push? In, uh, well, field, in addition to, to, to Don Newman bellowing and... and he, he was a sweet man. Mm -hmm. I, I caught on <clears throat> after a while, um, and I, I want to make that real clear. Uh -huh. um, I enjoyed working with him. Um, somehow, I got Richard Quinney was living in Rhode Island in Providence at the time, and somebody in the sociology department at Albany connected with me, who was a friend of Richard's, and said, You should go talk to Quinney. And I did. I think I went down to Providence, and he was very sweet talked to me about the field. Um, he was like a big cheese right then and cranking out all these books. Um, and that was, that gave me some confidence that here's somebody with a big name in the field would talk to me. And um, so I don't think I talked to him more than the one time. I didn't really have mentors. I think if there'd been more women at um, Albany, I could have, but um, gender relationships at the time were not, it, you, it was hard to find a male mentor. I went and talked to the, the dean, Richard Myron. Um, did you know him? He was later at Washington and, um, or one of the, maybe GW. And I said, Dean, sir, um, I wish we had more women faculty. And he said, well, I don't know what to make of that. When I was at Harvard Law School, we never thought about what, having more male or female professors. Well, of course, they were all male, and he was male, and it didn't matter. So, and I, I didn't 
I wasn't quick enough on my feet to say well. <laughs> the thing <laughs> is that these situations aren't <clears throat> parallel. Um, of course, it's changed right. completely now. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so within the, um, were there any sort of major influences, I mean, outside of uh, people, but any influences in the literature, uh, books, uh, themes, and, and uh, areas that you were interested in that uh, um, you see as particularly important to your start as a criminologist? Well, I was very interested in social constructionism. I think it was growing at the time out of labeling theory or the historian of the field. Um, you can probably correct me on this, but with, with labeling theory and then the ideas of social construct, with, with Berger and Luckman started to come out of there. So that really interested me. Um, and I was looking for a dissertation topic that might be able to pick up on that. Uh, the school at Albany in criminal justice at that time had a small library. Um, and I was browsing one day and I saw a book by a man named Mark Holler um, called Eugenics. And I pulled it out and opened it up and read the words defective delinquents, um, which was a name back in the 1920s that eugenicists gave to so-called feeble-minded criminals. And I knew someone was trying to scare somebody with this label. I got interested in who was trying to terrorize who. Um, so I, I, I tracked that down. I can't remember how I did. But it turned out that New York had passed the country's first, well, no, Massachusetts was first, the second um, defective delinquent law. And there were actually separate prisons where defective delinquents could be held for up to life in New York State. So you can see how this fed into my social constructionist um, interests. And um, so I wrote my dissert dissertation on defective delinquents. Okay, so for the benefit of our... Um, Am I being obscure? Of, well, for the benefit of our viewers, um, can you sort of sketch out exactly what you mean by um, social constructionism and how your dissertation was social constructionist and what, what that means. Okay. We'll give it a shot. Okay. <laughs> um, I think of social construction uh, as referring to the way um, concepts are formed and given significance. Uh, not, yeah, concepts or monuments or movies or um, how Bonnie and Clyde, who were they, but how are they um, created through social and kind of cultural influences to be heroes, a certain kind of criminal, and so on. Um, the movie Bonnie and Clyde changed a lot of things there. Uh, in the case of defective delinquents, I mean, what eugenicists of the teens and 20s felt was that the reason people commit crime is that they aren't smart enough to recognize what the law is and to do the right thing. They must be feeble-minded to use the term terminology that they did, and they later changed that to defective delinquents. So I might be a delinquent, Probably I'm a defective delinquent, meaning I'm defective mentally, and that's the reason that I'm defective. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a delinquent. Right. Yeah. So it's it's the the social construction piece. Then, did you look at the when you talk about the how the concepts were created? Mm -hmm. So at that point in your career, did you were you starting to to ask questions about whether it was this group or that group or how groups? different groups were responsible for the creation of those concepts and the uh, changing understanding of those concepts over over time? I did. I did. And I, looked, I went way back into the 19th century looking at how um, people with weak intelligence um, People with intellectual disabilities, I guess, would be the politically correct term now, 
um, but how they were first identified, um, what made people decide that if you're born with low intelligence, that that couldn't be changed. In fact, the original theory was that it could be changed um, through training, and many people feel that today, at least somewhat changed. Um, so I looked at all these different social groups, but it was not too hard to see the class interests behind this because the people the leading eugenicists all over the world were upper middle class people and they were criminalizing people who were working class or underclass people all over the world. So it was very much a social class based theory. And then I followed it through the establishment of these prisons in Massachusetts and in New York and I, I watched the movement de-escalate because they couldn't afford to keep everybody. The idea was you had to keep defective delinquents for life locked up um, so they wouldn't have little delinquents, but it was too expensive for them, so they changed their minds. <laughs> yeah. so, so we spent some time talking about um, sort of early influences on your, your career choice and, and things like that. Um, I, I wonder, uh, you know, when we think about I mean, you just brought up notions of labeling and, and how people are, are viewed, viewed by others. Um, and this is a little, maybe a little bit of a step back, but do you think that, if you think back on your, your childhood, adolescence, perhaps early adulthood, do you think any of the people you were closest to ever would have thought that you would have gone on to become a um, famous criminologist and part of the oral history project? Not sure about the famous, <laughs> famous part. Um, no. I mean, even to get a doctorate was very unexpected for people in my family. I mean, my father didn't even want me to go to college because I got married young, and he said, it's not worth educating you because you're just going to be a parent. He changed his mind, and he did pay for the tuition at Swarthmore. I mean, to be fair to him. Yeah. Um, but he didn't pay for graduate school. So this wasn't something that uh, anybody in your family would have seen coming early on? No? So. No, no, they probably thought I was a little delinquent, but... <laughs> yeah. But certainly not feeble-minded, right? <laughs> um, so, okay. Um, I didn't ask. <laughs> fair enough. Uh, so if... Uh, um, so if we start to, to consider some of your your body of research, and it's an impressive body of research. It takes up a couple of shelves in our display case at Northeastern. Um, so, I mean, what what do you see as the? I mean, if you were to describe to someone who hasn't read anything that you've written yet, what would you see as? How would you describe the major topics of? Your, oh, gee. Your work? Um, I've danced around a lot, um, and I think that the advice to most people is to be consistent and build. You're a theorist, and you would probably continue to be a theorist. Um, so I began with history. I began very early with an interest in people with intellectual disabilities for whatever reason. I don't have anyone in my family, but um, I was very um, much drawn to them and the way societies often read their own predicaments onto people with intellectual disabilities and blame them for things. And also just, play, oh, well, that, I'm getting off the topic, but they get blamed a lot for things that go on in criminal justice because if you if you are um, weak in intelligence and the cops get you, you don't know how to put the dime in the phone booth or it's probably ordered today to make a call to somebody to help you. But I lost track of what you were yeah, So in terms of just the sort of the major oh, topics, the major topics. thematic areas. Okay, so that's <clears throat> history, people with intellectual disabilities. Then I got interested in movies 
and in visual criminology. Um, maybe we should come back to that. Um, I got interested in biological theories of crime and more recently in genocide. So I think I'm a very bad role model because it's better for people to focus and build on what they learned already rather than jumping around. Okay, so so you think so you see all of these as, as discrete topical areas or is there some thread that, that well, connects them? There are bio biographical threads um, that connect them, uh, but... Do you want to explain some of those? Yeah, I could tell you about the crime film stuff. Sure. Um, I, it was during a difficult part of my life at school, and so when I'd come home on the Green Line at night, I'd get off at Coolidge Corner, and there was a place called the Video Smith there back in the days when you went and bought these, <laughs> rented these things on tape, and I'd pick up movies, not necessarily crime films, but most of the good films were crime films, and so I'd take them home at night and watch them. Uh, not long after I'd started doing that, Robert and I went away on a holiday, and I took along a book um, called The Celluloid Closet. The author's last name was Russo, R-U-S-S-O. I can't remember his first name. Anyway, it was about gays in the movies. And so I was <clears throat> reading about the subtext of a lot of movies um, that had um, gays in them. And I thought, gee, I could do that for crime films, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, pulling out themes uh, that may not be uh, obvious or that would connect various crime themes over time. So that's how I got interested in the movies right. and stuff, and it was a lot of fun um, doing that. Um, when I went to Austria, I was going to start writing, I had a Fulbright, so I taught a couple times a week, but I was going to start writing a history of criminology. Uh, but I found out that if the town where I was was Linz, L-I-N-Z, um, and it turned out to be Hitler's hometown and Eichmann's hometown. And I could go on and on um, with other, I mean, it was really the birthplace of National Socialism. Um, and I couldn't get away from it. I mean, Hitler's day school, his grade school, was a few blocks down this way. His mother ho mother's house was that way. His parents' graves were in the next town and so on. So I was just transfixed by this. Um, and then it turned out that a few k's down the road was something called Hartheim Castle. Uh, which had been an institution for the feeble-minded in Austria, uh, in Upper Austria. Um, but once the Nazis came in, they turned it into an extermination center for people with mental disabilities. Later, other people too. One of the first gas chambers was set up there. So you see how the different things are coming together for me and there was no, I had no chance of writing a history uh -huh. <laughs> of criminology there. Um, so I got interested in genocide. Yeah, so it's kind of an interesting um, loop back to some of your work as a doctoral student then. It was. And the um, fact that, that sort of ends of your career really points on a circle of, of your career that, that it's come back and really interesting way, I think, to uh, looking at issues of feeble-mindedness and how that then prompted you to, to look at some other other issues and uh, yeah. the treatment of, of people who are classified as feeble-minded. So yeah. It's interesting. Um, and so across all of these, um, these different topics, right, think about feeble-minded or the, the movie visual uh, criminology, mm -hmm. 
more recent work on, on genocide. Um, do you see a, um, a theme that, I mean, there's the feeble-minded, or the concern with, with feeble-minded. There's, it seems in some of your work, there's, there's concern, attention to issues of gender, uh, issues of mm -hmm. class. So, are there any other kind of broad themes that, that you see in your work? I know the topics, for somebody just to look at, at, a series, at a list of your books, the topics might strike somebody as fairly eclectic. But if they look at the contents of the they book, are. They, they, they connect, and I mean, they're pieces of a, of a, of a mosaic, right? They, at least they, they do make more sense than you might at first <clears throat> think. Um, partly through these biographical um, connections, um, which ended me up with the book on genocide that I'm just finishing now, but um, also methodologically, there are, are repeats um, that may not be at, uh, obvious at first. They weren't obvious at first to me either. Mm -hmm. um, but it, what I tend to do is to do comparative work and get often fairly large groups of things to compare um, and then do the comparisons across. So, um, for example, with the films, get a group of police films and compare either within or then compare across with a group of, of uh, court films, you know, and pick up, see what the, the themes are that are going across or um, concerns or uh, fears um, that, that go across. With the genocide book, I've got eight genocides. Um, it's kind of a complicated methodology, but just to be brief about it. So I've got these eight, eight genocides, and um, I, I researched each one of, they, they, I, I selected them. They're, it's kind of a random sample of genocides committed throughout the 20th century and around the world except that they're weighted because I picked them to, to correspond to the frequency of genocides in different areas. So for example, I have two for <coughs> Africa okay. um, because there were more gen uh, genocides in Africa in the 20th century and none in North America. That's debatable. Well, anyway, not in the 20th century. Um, and so I, I, I researched each one of the genocides in depth. I had, I think it's 32 questions on my questionnaire. And so I would fill out my questionnaire as I read um, till I had all the questions answered to my satisfaction. And then um, one of our lovely graduate students, Laura Sierra, came in and she said, what can I do for you? And I said, I need help. And she <laughs> said, I love to help people. <laughs> That's Laura, right? Yeah, it is. And she said, ah, in vivo. She said, just leave it to me. And she went and she found an undergraduate to help her. And she in vivoed all my genocides. And so I could read across. It was really a way of presenting the, the texts to me. Question one, I could read across for eight, for eight genocides. So, um, so there again, I've, I've got big things and I'm comparing them. Right, right. And um, I know one of the, the issues we've we've discussed, just the, the, the two of us, on previous occasions, right, that, and I think, I mean, this is probably true for lots and lots of us in the academic world that publish and all that, that it's really difficult to disentangle biographical personal experiences from academic interests and, and the like. And you know, one of the um, sort of, I would call it a subtext to some mm -hmm. of your other, other work is, is really a concern with um, kind of marginality, I think is mm -hmm. the, the word we've, we've yeah. used to kind of capture that. And I guess I wonder if you'd speak to that a little bit as sure. it cuts across your, yeah. Different, yeah. your different works. Well. A lot of the time I'm, I'm dealing with marginalized populations, 
women, women in prison was the topic of my first book. Um, the feeble-minded criminals. Um, I've, I've done a number of studies of that topic. Um, criminals in general, victims of genocide. Um, I, I can't. Yeah, and then your work in the academy. I mean, as a professor at Northeastern, did that? How's that? Concerned for work, oh, you mean who I've sort of tended to help? And, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, your other so not just the the straight intellectual pursuits, but some of your other like uh, professional pursuits and interests. Well, I introduced one of the first courses in women in crime in the country. I mean, I've I've always been interested in trying to reach out more to groups that. Um, maybe don't have a way to relate to things in standard curriculum. I've dealt a lot with race in my courses, although I never taught the course in race and crime. Is that the sort of thing you meant? I think so. I think so. Okay. I had such a nice thing happen, Chad. Yes. I didn't tell you about this. <clears throat> Just within the last month or two, I got a letter from a woman named Pam Foley, who'd been in my first Women in Crime course back in 1982, wow. and she wrote to me and told me what an impact this had had on her life. She could remember the textbooks she read, I mean, because there wasn't a textbook. Um, so she, I gave them things, real books, you know, like the yellow wallpaper. And she remembered the books, and she still, um, she wanted to know what to read, because she's going back to get her master's in fine arts and feminist literature. Isn't that neat? That's terrific. Yeah, I yeah. was very happy about that. Yeah, no, that's yeah. that's great. Yeah. It's a really nice um, sort of delayed kind of acknowledgement <laughs> and recognition of, of, um, of work that you've done. Yeah, I, I was very pleased. Yeah. So of all of your um, sort of scholarly works, and, and they are indeed numerous, I think on my notes here, um, you have that uh, Given the various revisions and, and the like, we have what thirteen books that you've you've written or edited, that's right. and um, that's a uh, it's quite an accomplishment. Plus a number of other articles and other kinds of kinds of reports. So if you think about that that entire body of work, um, is there you know one or two that you have a particular pride satisfaction over? Something that, that you still feel warm and fuzzy about? Well, I still feel warm and fuzzy about the genocide book, and it's not even published yet. Okay. I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah. Um, let's see what the reviewers say. Right. And the reviews come into the publisher in a couple of weeks. Maybe it'll be cut down. Um, but I, I, you know, I'll finish it. It'll yeah. get published. Um, I think it's the Lombrosa books that I like the best. Uh, I told this to my friend Paul Rock in England once, and I said, why is this, you know? And he said, it's because you didn't write it, you know, that you really, <laughs> it's, it, you, it, it feels more apart from you. But um, Mary Gibson and I translated Lombroso's two main criminological works, Criminal Man and Criminal Woman, Criminal Woman, as he put it. Um, and I really enjoyed doing that, and um, I, I, I'm very proud of that, that mm -hmm. I did it. So what inspired you to, to learn <laughs> Italian and, and do that kind uh, of uh, translation? Well, Mary, she's a real, I mean, she speaks Italian fluently. She was a friend of mine, um, uh, and she's an Italian historian, and she, she teaches at John Jay, so she, we both write about, we were both writing about crime in the 19th century. When was this? Uh, probably the 19, early 1990s. And, um, <clears throat> but we were both having the same problem. We talked about it, we didn't know what to do about it because Lombroso 
published five editions of Criminal Man. He did it over 20 years, and he changed his mind a lot um, about the causes of crime and what, many things. Um, so you couldn't say for a certain, in 1882, Lombroso thought this. There was no way to know because the books hadn't been translated. There was one translation, but no one knew where it came from, like which edition had it been plucked from. Um, the American <coughs> Institute of Criminal Law and Criminology that published that pretty early on. Um, but that who, it wasn't any help because she didn't know when he wrote it. So I was up in Vermont where Robert lived um, one day and it came to me that um, somebody should translate Lombroso. And so I went out in the driveway and I dialed Mary and I said, sit down, I'm going to ask you something. And I said, you, would you like to translate Lombroso? I didn't speak one word of Italian. I mean, I couldn't <laughs> say ciao. <laughs> um, and she said, oh, that's a very serious question. It would take a lot of thought. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it was just like that. She, she saw it immediately. So it took us 11 years um, to do it, the whole thing. And we had a wonderful time. We met in New Jersey and in Oxford, England, uh, where I had fellowship. Um, Venice, where I was living for a while. Um, we just, wherever we met, Boston, of course. Um, we whipped out our tons and tons and tons of Xeroxes and went to work. Oh, and I lived in Rome for a year, and Mary happened to be have a fellowship there. She's always got a fellowship in Rome um, <laughs> to do some kind of research. And so she would do her research on prisons in the morning, and then she'd walk across the Tiber to my apartment, and we'd sit down and have a late lunch, and we'd start translating the Rosso. So it was wonderful fun, and I'm very proud of that. I'm sorry to talk so long. No, we that's, had such a good time. That's no, that's that's terrific. Um, and so, of of if you think about that body of work too, um, what was the the most difficult piece to to write? Because I'm sure to, they, to translate. Do you mean or? Um, not so much translation, but if we you know we think about your thirteen books. Um, oh, was oh that, that was, body of work. Yeah, was, my work. Your work, yeah. Was there something that was, were any of those particularly difficult? Or? Chapter 5 of the genocide book almost killed me. Okay, so you want to tell us about <laughs> Chapter 5 in the genocide book? I'm not going to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it was, I was trying, I'm trying to do in the genocide book to talk about um, micro, meso, and macro factors involved in genocide, and I think I just drove myself crazy um, trying to figure out what all the macro factors were, looking at various scholars' analyses of the topic, looking at my own eight genocides, um, and putting it all together. I just didn't know how to talk about it, and it seemed boring. I keep, I kept going back thinking you've left out <laughs> the most important thing of all. You know, you probably had this problem, right? You just so struggle over uh, one thing. I think we all have. <laughs> um, and so, for us mere mortals, it's good to hear that that <laughs> other people struggle too. Uh, so, but so this sounds. Things were hard too earlier. Too. So with a with chapter five in the genocide book. So this is a it sounds like it's an attempt to link theoretically several really complicated processes at, at different levels. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, like war, civil war, um, state failure, and so on. And how do they nest into each other? Those three plus other factors. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it. Um, and then, um, so then, as we as we talk about your larger body of um, of work, um, one, um, I mean, a couple of questions we we could ask here, but uh, I think one that that might be kind of kind of fun would be, um, what would you say was your most controversial work? 
and, and, and why? Hmm. Well, I think initially uh, my interest in women's issues, which were not t talked about back then and whenever that book um, first appeared. Actually, that book was controversial before it appeared because um, when I first came to Northeastern, maybe this was late 70s, mm -hmm. or early, maybe around 1980, and I wrote a grant application to NIJ, uh, which had an unsolicited component to the program. Um, that was a very good thing because it meant flaky people like myself could write in with ideas that no one at NIJ would ever have, like writing a history of women's prisons. So I got the grant. Hooray! And then they took it away because, um, th I didn't tell you this story about Senator Proxmire. Well, you've told me about uh, uh, Okay, uh, keep going. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, Senator Proxmire used to give, who's a, he was a wonderful guy, he used to give a Golden Fleece Award for the worst waste of government money. And um, the year before this, somebody had been given money to do a study of Boston courts in 1824, something like that. And Senator Proxmire had threatened to expose NIJ for this waste of money. And they thought back to that, and they thought, uh, uh, you know, he'll for sure get us for women's prisons. So they took it away. I was crushed. Um, Robert and I had hired a sitter so we could go away together for the weekend to the Cape. And I said, too bad, we got work to do. And so we took along a huge old typewriter and went to the Cape and set it up on a coffee table and I wrote 10 pages for a new grant proposal with the problems of the women's prison system origins and development and so I gave it a new intro and the rest was all the same and they gave me back the grant so that was a little controversial mm -hmm. um, at least with Senator Proxmire perhaps um, but you know people haven't paid a lot of attention to my work the way they would other people's work because it seemed so peripheral to what's going on in the field. So it didn't matter if somebody, some kooky person, was writing a history of women's prisons. So I, I've never had huge controversy, I don't mm -hmm. think. So what about the criminal brain? Well, the criminal brain, um, which is a history of biological theories of crime, um, has not been attacked. <clears throat> I carried it up into the present and said we're moving toward a biosocial model. Um, and so far as I know, no reviewers attacked it for that. They will, however, because now I'm doing a second edition, uh, which I'm writing with two of our former graduate students. And we're going much further. We're going to be much, take a more radical stand on the evolution of a biosocial uh, model and on the importance of developing biosocial criminology. Um, and so my guess is that will be more controversial in the long run. So um, let's see if we. Um, so if we turn to a couple of questions, get you to think about your career at a sort of a more five, ten thousand foot um, foot level, right? Um, and then I know you probably hate this question once once I ask it. I don't even know what five or ten thousand foot <laughs> just, <to> mean. <laughs> just kind of take a step back or a couple of steps back and and try to look okay. at, at well, what you've okay. done. And, and so how, I mean, so you've, you've mentioned this briefly a, a couple of minutes ago, but um, what are your sort of identifying characteristics as, as a scholar? You talked about your methodology a little while ago. Um, I don't know if you wanted to elaborate a bit more on that. Um, 
but please sir so so well if if I mean so say you how would you answer this question well I get to ask the question. So, <laughs> so how how would you describe yourself? I mean, it were, well, how would you describe Nikki Rafter, right, to to some third party? Uh, and you know, you've got some. Say, there's a. Okay, let's do a hypothetical. So we've got a uh, uh, prospective doctoral student who's considering the uh, the program, and they're trying to think. Oh, well, should I go to this this university where? Professor Nicole Rafter is listed on, on the roster, and I see some of her of her books. And then they they ask you, well, well what do you know about her as, as as a scholar? How would you describe her as, as, as a, a scholar? scholar? Yeah. Not as a teacher. Well, you could do both. I I don't know how a prospective graduate student would think of me as a scholar. But, I mean, people do come along. To, to our program, mm -hmm. or to if we have a discussion group right. a few months ahead of time, they come in and they say, I really want to study biological theories of crime, or uh, I really want to do this historical work, or so on. So I say, fine. But as a, as a teacher, I think I'm pretty low key. Um, I'm, I try to be very supportive, um, particularly with doctoral students. Um, I think I get much further with doctoral students by giving them their head and lots and lots of encouragement um, and leaving it for the other two committee members to give them a hard time while I hold them up and support them. Um, it doesn't mean I never say anything negative. Um, I give them a hard time on the writing. Um, 2014 to... PhD was 1978, right? Uh-huh, that's yeah. right. So, yeah. so is there anything that you would have done differently mm. if you had the opportunity? Had more money uh, so I could hire babysitters because Robert was um, living usually in a different state or a different part of Massachusetts because of his work. And I had two kids to raise, and it was awfully hard. Um, and never having you know enough time, it, it was hard. Right, so you were in a lot of ways a single parent in a tenure track position. Yeah, and we used to have the trimester system, um, so it was two courses, two courses, two courses every year. Um, my father died in the middle of my first year. Um, and I was writing this NIJ grant and trying to publish and all this stuff. So if I'd had a little more free time, I could have led a less stressful life. Um, but you don't get to, you don't have control over that sort of thing, do you? No. No one does. No, not really. So you can't think of any other things? Uh, and, and you wouldn't really have control over, uh, over having more money, right? That would have been somebody else's choice. But no other things that you might have done differently? Maybe I sh if, if I were knew what I know now, I wouldn't have been so scared okay. um, about getting tenure. I mean, uh, Robert had put me through graduate school and then he decided to go back to graduate school. So I said, it's my turn to support the kids. Uh, but if I didn't get tenure, Chip, what would I have done? I mean, that's why I was really panicked all the time about that. And uh, so I felt I had to publish more and more now. So I probably have relaxed more and focused more. Um, but again, you, you don't get to lead your life again. No, no. Um, but you can offer advice to young scholars. Then I'd say, do what you want to do. Don't worry too much about tenure. Don't be, don't be a good girl. I'd say if it was a female, um, uh, follow your own inclinations and interests. Have fun. Uh, you might as well enjoy yourself. And here these people are. They're so intelligent, they're well-educated, 
why not uh, follow your own lead? So is that, um, so I know, you know, as in uh, working in Northeastern, but I know that you've been working with our, our untenured and now primarily associate level faculty for the last several years. And um, you know, partly a writer's workshop and you know, you've become the, the lead facilitator with that. And um, so if you were to, to sort of characterize, and I think why I bring this up is I think it's, it's a forum where you probably get to pass along some of that, that kind of advice, or at least the perspective. And I wonder, you know, is there, you have some kind of organizing philosophy or approach to that group, or does it just sort of organically? Leave them alone. Oh, and what does that mean in terms of leaving? I, do, I don't do much, Chet. Okay. Maybe you have, no, no. So. You think I'm in there working hard. Yeah. I just give them their head. I mean, they all have wonderful... Right. I'm not okay. getting your so you, question No, anymore. no, you've used that phrase a couple of times. What does it mean to give them their head? Give them their head. Well, I don't give them advice. Okay. So... If they are always using dangling modifiers, I say, let's go into the back room and I'll show you what a dangling modifier is. But um, I don't to shape their work. Right. They, they, they do that themselves. Right. No, and, that, and that's, I think, one of the great things that, that we've all seen come out of this, this group, um, that you haven't like, tried to manage their work. But, I wouldn't know how. Right, <laughs> they're right. all <laughs> much smarter than I am, and they're methodologically s sophisticated. Right, but you've created an environment where they feel where they can talk to each other about their work. They don't need you to comment on their work, and but it's a um, what's the phrase I was looking for? That there's you've helped, I guess, create a um, sort of a peer mentoring set of, of relationships uh, among those, those faculty that I think is, is fairly admirable and um, I think it's done wonders for um, you know, the collegiality and the, the sort of environment that uh, we all work in at uh, Northeastern. I think the only thing I did was to <clears throat> say nothing leaves this room, that whatever we talk about here it doesn't, I don't talk to the senior faculty. Nothing gets to a tenure committee. Um, and so we all just talk to one another and make suggestions. I do make suggestions every now and then. Um, you provide the sandwiches. <laughs> That's, easy. That's very important to have food. It's easy. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my part's easy. I just write the check. People feel so. nurtured. Yeah. Yeah, by the college. Oh, I think yeah. And they're good sandwiches. Oh, good. Actually, I think they're, they feel nurtured, but maybe less by the college and more by the group. The, they, the group, they're very nurturing to one another. Right. And you know, they come to these ASC meetings and they all go out to dinner together. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. terrific. It is. And, uh, so it's not, and it's not something historically that we've had at the, in the school. And it's really That's nice true. to have seen that evolve and, and develop and I know you probably chafe at the notion of causal language or, or things to that effect but it just correlates with your time of helping to coordinate the group. It's been a privilege for me, it's been so much fun and I learn a great deal by seeing these different kinds of research that I, you know, I wouldn't read them if I picked right. up a journal. Yeah, yeah. So, um, then if, you know, just Thinking about um, other impacts that, that you might have had, effects on, on other individuals, and I mean, can you can you think of um, individuals that you would think of as, as mentees that have gone on to do other things, and um, you know how you know how if you want to speculate on, on sort of what you did to, to help them or how, say, their work later on came back to, to help you. I think you just mentioned something with our, our um, more junior faculty that exposing you to other ways of thinking and oh, yeah. analyzing, but... Well, um, being at this conference and knowing this question's on the list 
has made me think about this a lot. And so I'm sensitized to it. And I realize I do a hell of a lot of mentoring. Um, first day here, had lunch with a guy from Norway um, who wrote to me originally. Uh, he was writing a dissertation on Lombroso. I couldn't, he wrote in English, but it was very hard to understand. Um, and we're, 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 we eventually wrote an article together on Lombroso, and uh, we worked together, and I now was asking him at lunch today um, for advice on the book I'm thinking of doing in the future. He's real smart, and he knows me very well. He knows the things I'm good at. Um, so that's very gratifying. Um, Amy won an award for being the best mentor in the ASC this year, um, and she wanted me to share the award with her, <laughs> which I refused to do. But um, Amy's helped me more than I've helped her, but it's been a great pleasure to see Amy um, become the wonderful scholar she is. And there, Chad, Chad Posick and Mike Roke, who were the, the graduate students I referred to earlier as people, well, maybe I forgot, but they were in the, my biological theories of crime class three or four years ago. And now they're out in the world um, with their own positions. They're, they're professors, one in Maine and one in Southern Georgia, but we're writing the second edition of the biological, the criminal brain book, the, the book on biological theories together. And so we had a good time up last night in the rooftop lounge, drinking a beer and planning out the next, you know, so we, we're working together now. It's, it's forming, uh, making my own colleagues in a way. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I think that's probably an underappreciated or, or maybe not well understood notion of, of mentoring that you know really is a the kind of a process of bringing people along to the point where we feel comfortable with them as as true colleagues and we think of them as colleagues rather than mentees or students or yeah. some other kind of um, acquaintance that, that we might yeah might good to. friends is the way I think of it another one is Michelle Brown a young woman who <coughs> teaches at um, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I can't even remember where I first met her. But we got along while she was much younger. Um, we started, we wrote something together, then we wrote a book together. Uh, now I'm writing a chapter for her book, you know, and so yeah. on like that. So you make your own colleagues that right. way. Yeah. yeah, no, it's and terrific. Friends. It's yeah. terrific. Um, now about the, um, about criminology, the field. Right, if we think about, uh, say the, um, so what's your take on the, uh, say the, the state of the field, right? Are there any uh, questions that you think the field should um, spend more time looking at? Are there concerns that you have about the direction that the field might be, be going in? Some, at the same time, the flip side of that, or, you know, there, there, uh, is there a direction that, that some of the work's going that, that you find particularly enticing and attractive? Um, I'd like to see more courses on crimes against humanity. Um, I was very grateful to have that opportunity at Northeastern to put that course into the curriculum. And um, I was mentioning it in a group today, there was a, there's a workshop on state crime here and um, mentioned that how, what a good umbrella topic that is, because it doesn't need to be only the atrocity crimes right. like genocide, but um, the students would pick topics, uh, pioneers who committed cannibalism, and you know, right. you know they they pick their own topics, their own definition of crimes against humanity. Um, I'd like I'd like to see. I think it's important though to look more at state crime and particularly at the big, big crimes like genocide, war crimes, and, and what are more technically called crimes against humanity. Um, and I'd also like to see more 
courses on biological theories um, because it's, I think, as Frank Collin has said, sociological theorizing is just about at a dead end. I think because it doesn't, it pretends that we're not biological creatures or creatures in the world that, you know, who live and um, interact with one another biologically. That's, and that's, um, so much is known now about how we become who we are. So I think that sociological theories are kind of have to integrate more biological theorizing to become strong again or to be as effective as they could be. And, and to trace the mechanisms between how it is that Johnny takes the sandwich from the deli. Right. You know, and there's a lot that biological theories can explain about that, other than being hungry. Right, right, <laughs> right. yeah. So, um, so, so you would be, it sounds like supportive of some of the more recent Supreme Court and other court decisions that uh, mm -hmm. you know, have started to look at issues of brain development and you know, say early mid-20s before brain development's complete. And it's something that, that sociological theories have no capacity to, to deal with that kind of fact. Right? And so how, I mean, how would you see Sociological theories of, of crime, delinquency. You know, can you think of a, a specific way or example in which they might be able to incorporate a? Oh sure. A, well, social control theory, mm -hmm. for example. Um, there's a lot of evidence now that um, some people are born with a greater potential <clears throat> for self-control. Um, I meant to say something. Um, than, than other people are. It's a biosocial interaction from the start because even in utero, if the fetus is getting a lot of smoke, alcohol, um, not good nutrition um, in terms of what the mother uh, is eating, um, then these deficits develop. So it's, it's a biosocial right. interaction. But once the kid is born, then as an organism, it keeps interacting with the environment, and kids just, some of them don't develop very much in the way. They, they may begin with deficits that then don't get overcome. Right, or that may become sense. worse, yeah. That become worse. Sometimes. Or could, do, yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. a ways for yeah. those to go, yeah. Um, and then I guess the, the um, her final comment and question, I guess, would be, you know, is there anything else that, that you would like our viewers to know about, uh, about you, um, perspectives on the field, your work, anything else that you would want I to share? I think you covered things pretty well. You think? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not crazy about talking about myself anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you well, for thank you. doing this for me. I so, very much appreciate it. It was a real pleasure and an honor to, to get to do this. Thank you.